Hey everybody, Sylvie here. Dog training and com and behavior community. Do I know where I am? Yeah, I do. Um, sorry, I'm a couple of minutes late. Great to see you. So it's Tuesday evening chat. It's six o'clock today instead of um, a little bit later. And um, as usual, about a half hour talk we're going to do. Um, I had a couple of people ask about uh, some topics. Uh, one was research recording, which was one I was already thinking about. And um, somebody mentioned house training. So hopefully that person has found the information they were looking for. Um, and some of you may not know this. Uh, hi, Chantal. It's good to see you. And um, <clears throat> so some Facebook groups, you can set them up as social learning. I don't know. Facebook has done so many changes. So there used to be learning units and then they changed the name to guides. Um, this group originally was house training for puppies and dogs and I changed it and to become a little bit more. So those guides are still there and I do have, um, a lot of little bits and information in there about house training. So, um, if you're struggling and you need to, hi Henrik, thanks for joining. If you need to look at that or somebody struggling, you can look through that information because there's a, a lot of helpful information. Um, house training is a behavior, so it's something that we do want to teach, but we also want to consider other factors that are contributing to that. So I'm not sure, I can't remember who asked, sorry. Um, I'm just getting back to things. I've been off for a week. Um, and slowly getting back at it, still working from home this week. And, um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so those guides are there, um, in case you didn't know, and, um, they're there. I didn't take them down when I changed the group and, um, I don't really add anything to the group. It's a free group. So. You know, if you can show up for the lives, you can ask them questions and just something to keep in mind too, that, um, yes, it's, um, dog training and behavior community, and it's not meant to replace real professional help. Uh, I am professional certified dog trainer, certified behavior consultant, and, um, also certified in separation anxiety, but, um, I'm happy to steer people in the right direction in regards to issues and, um, but I can't solve, you know, um, severe behavior stuff, but I can, um, give you, uh, hints and stuff. But so the other topic that someone wanted me to talk about was resource guarding. And that's kind of loaded word that gets thrown around. It's a label. Um, but essentially it's when we want to guard something that's of value of, to us. And when we think about it, it's not an abnormal behavior at all. And, um, we resource guard as well. We have locks on our doors. We, well, many of us have fences around our yards with gates in them. Um, many of us would be very alarmed if somebody walked through our gate and started picking up our things and walking away, we would get, well, I guess there would be a variety of reactions depending on who you are as an individual and who you are in regards to what you've experienced in the past. Um, and also about how your day is gone um and how many good things or bad things of that have happened so um i like to put that a bit into perspective um i don't want to hey anita finally anita is back back in the house and um i certainly don't want to downplay that um resource guarding but it is not an abnormal behavior but when we start seeing um you know, reactions and owners get worried about reactions and rightly so, but something we want to think about is 
when there's a reaction, it's communication and we need to listen to the dog and we need to understand why is this happening. I have, I am seeing resource guarding getting a, a little more predominant and, um, and I think that we also want to think about that resource guarding. <laughs> yeah. Um, we also want to think about resource guarding um, is it can be stress based. Uh, and, you know, every every dog is an individual. They have their own personality. And like I say, they have their own experiences. And um, there's a lot of reasons um, why it's happening. Dogs like to resource guard uh, valued things, valued spaces. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to see some resource guarding between dogs. Um, you know, sometimes if we're there is not enough space, um, it can contribute to resource guarding. And we, again, we want to look at the picture and what's going on because there are a lot of things that do contribute um, to resource guarding. Like I say, um, environments that maybe are too small. If we've got multi-dog household, um, if we're just talking about one dog um, and they're resource guarding with us, um, you know, sometimes there's other cat, there can be other species in the house like cats. And we kind of, you know, don't take that into consideration, but um, you know, why is your dog worried about you um, wanting to take something away? Um, now, dogs will resource guard a variety of um, objects and um, there's no, well, often owners will say there's no rhyme or reason and that's, you know, you saying that, but there's a rhyme or reason for the dog. Um, so, <clears throat> um... I don't, I, th I think street dogs that haven't had a lot of food, you might see resource guarding develop because of that. And that just makes sense. Um, you know, cause I mean, think about it. If they've, if they've got a fight for, um, if they got a fight to eat, then, you know, that's resource guarding. So that can, um, I think there's, you know, people who, um, get dogs that live off the street and sometimes see that. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's definitely a possibility. There's so many variables to it. Um, but yeah, so dogs will decide what they're going to resource guard. They could just resource guard their water bowl. They could resource guard their food bowl. Um, I never suggest just leaving food bowls on the ground. It's like, why would you? Do you leave the, your plates on the table? You know, pick them up, put them in and wash them out. Um, you know, that's healthy for the dog and, um, you know, feed them in a place where they're not worried that you're going to come and disturb them while they're eating. We don't like to be sitting there and suddenly wa somebody walking up to us and, you know, what are you doing? What are you eating? Sticking your, um, you know, <laughs> your hand, their hand on your plate. Um, you know, just like some, when I was a kid, I loved front. I still love french fries but when I was a kid I love french fries even more because we did not get them a lot um it was a treat and so for a very 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 long time when I became older teenager adult and I was able to purchase french fries on my own um I did not want to share them because you know, they were a valued resource. I wouldn't snap at anybody, but I would like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I would hesitate, but, um, you know, now I have no problem and, you know, I can't eat all the fries anyway, but, um, you know, it just, it, it really does depend. Um, some dogs will resource guard only a Kong toy. Some dogs will only resource a particular chew toy. Some dogs will, you know, um, I think Anita said, um, maybe just tissues. Um, you know, it's, you decide what's valuable to you. We don't decide that for a dog. 
I can say and will say is if you have a dog that's resource guarding a lot, a lot of items, that can be tricky to work with, okay? Um, and usually it doesn't start off that way. Um, sometimes we just don't notice and it gets worse and we don't get professional help. And then it starts to spread um, literally like a wildfire. And um, when that happens, it gets out of control. And the more it, that is on the list that your dog is going to resource guard is going to make things more difficult to actually um, modify. So that's definitely, I found owners that dogs whose owners just let their dog out alone in the backyard for a couple of hours, instead of going for long walks, develop some sort of resource guarding. Yeah. So I would look at that and I would look at, you know, um, yeah, they're getting a nice long walk. So they're getting stimulation. They're getting enrichment. Um, if they're just in the backyard for hours, what kind of enrichment are they getting? Um, you know, walks aren't necessarily, I would say the answer per se, but more to the point where going for walks is stimulation and enrichment and we're not giving the dogs that. So, um, I do see resource guarding, not all of them. It depends on the case. It depends on what's going on. It depends on what's on the environment, um, where resource guarding does come out of worry. Um, uh, of stress. So, you know, like what you're describing, if the dog's not getting enough satisfaction in their, in their world, then you get anxious, you get stressed. And it, again, it depends on the, on the individual dog. It depends on how they're living and hungry. We used to feed the dogs two times a day and, and my Caucasians and GSPs used to eat next to each other with no problem. It happens more with dogs that have been, yes. So, um, definitely. Um, and that was one of the things I was going to mention. So thank you very much, Anita, for reminding me. And Henrik, you've brought up some really great points. Um, but, um, that's one, one of the really big things that I see is we are getting puppies and I do see um, we're opening up their world a little bit too fast and too quick for what they're really ready for. And, you know, they're going to do what's natural. Puppies investigate with their mouths, just like human toddlers investigate with their um, hands and they're going to explore. So, like I say, we often open up their world a little bit too fast and too quick. And then we're constantly taking things away from them. And that, in a way, is nagging. And that be can become very frustrating. And at some point, and it depends on the personality of the puppy, some puppies will just deal with it. Um, and some puppies will just finally, finally just, you know, and they may growl. And if you handle, if you don't handle it the right way, um, it will escalate and it does escalate if you don't deal with it. Um, so, you know, it's so easy to, to redirect puppies. Um, first of all, giving them more supervision so that they don't, um, aren't constantly getting into things. Yes, things, um, uh, you know, it, it's not a hundred percent perfect, but, um, I seldom have an issue with my puppies and, you know, if they start getting into something, you know, I just make a funny noise and as soon as they turn around and what are you doing? And I tell them how good they are and they come running over and I give them a treat and then, you know, I give them, um, a chew or a Kong or, um, you know, redirect them to their X pen or their bed. Um, so I've asked them to do something. They've totally forgotten what they want to get into. If they've already gotten it, I, I make a big deal of it, but not in the way that, um, owners will think. Um, there was a conversation on a group today. Well, how do I correct that? I don't correct it. I go, Oh, what do you got? Oh my God, you got something really cool. And then the, usually a puppy is very normal. You know, a young puppy is like. You want to see what I got? And they may run around you, 
but at least they're coming to you and then you can start praising, you know, and you can throw some things on the ground for them to start, you know, picking up and eating instead of, um, and then, you know, just wait until they've forgotten about the item that they have. So we are actually teaching dogs to resource guard by constantly taking things away from them um, because we're showing them it's valuable. It's like, well, they're constantly taking this, these, these things away. So they must be valuable. I, I, I must get them. I, I must, um, you know, I'm going to fight you for it. Um, would you think continuous anal swiping is part of razor guarding? As rubbing the anus up on the other dog or human as, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that seems a little, that's not part of resource guarding behavior. Um, you can see very subtle things. So usually they will put their neck over items. So if you see a dog and they have their neck over a favored, um, object, that's resource guarding. Um, already um, you start seeing stiff body movement so um, what you're describing sounds something different um, the dog's trying to tell you something and I'm not uh, um, yeah so Chantal you know just getting little snippets of information is really hard um, might not be resource guarding it could be um, just um, Sometimes if humans are close and dogs don't understand, so this is not uncommon for people to see reactions um, come from younger dogs or dogs that, you know, come from different environments. And if, you know, humans are hugging or anything like that, they don't understand that's hugging. Um, they see that as very different behavior and they, a lot of times, I mean, I cannot get in their head, but, uh, what you see is they're, they're like, oh my God, there's some kind of conflict. I need to split it up. And if they're splitting, that's a really, really good thing because they're doing it in a very nice way. They're not doing it aggressively. They're doing it the way it should be done in dog language. Um, if you've spent any time, you know, with real proper play and puppies and, um, so there is something called splitting, which they will do. You might see more, uh, excessive behaviors. Um, and that's, that's just not, uh, understanding them getting really, really worried. So Yelp, worry, stress, negative arousal, pessimism. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. Dogs that are pessimistic in nature, um, might resource guard. Um, what else we got? Dogs need a lot of attention from parents. If they don't, it develops. Mm, yeah, I'm not sure. It depends. Um, <laughs> the more the more behavior stuff you do, it's more it depends. Like you need to have more information. Um, needy dogs don't necessarily do resource guarding, I would say. I mean, Liam is really needy. He loves being close to us. That's who he is. He doesn't resource guard at all. Um, so, you know, that's not something that I really say, see, you know, act, action prompting maybe is what you're describing. And I wouldn't say that that's resource guarding. I would, I would need to know more details about that, but that's not like a hard and fast rule. Um, sometimes dogs will resource guard spaces. Um, so favorite sitting spaces is like, this is my favorite space and no, thank you. You're not coming up here. So, but there's easy ways to deal with that because the more skills that we teach our dogs in regards to life skills where we can communicate with them and communicate with them in a non-confrontational way, the more we can ask them of things and, um, and not create conflict. So, you know, resource guarding can, as it develops to be something, um, severe is often something that, you know, will develop. Um, some dogs just don't know how to disengage, 
Um, so there's that part of it as well. So there's, you know, it, it's one of those, it depends. Um, like I say, it can be stress-based a lot of the time. I, um, you know, I've helped owners where the resource guardian goes away when I kind of, um, you know, they're all, they're constantly wanting to take things away. I said, just let him have his favorite thing in his favorite place and just leave him alone. Just like when you want to go sit on the couch on your favorite corner and want to read your favorite book or do whatever on your, on your iPad and just leave me alone, right? Don't bug me. Um, so, you know, there's, sometimes there's that, um, sometimes between other dogs too, you want to be careful. Um, you know, there's always subtle body language and sometimes it turns out to nothing and sometimes it can um, you know, get worse depending like Emma resource guards a little bit. She did learn to resource guard with Liam because when he was a puppy, um, he tried to be a little too pushy. So, um, as soon as I recognized that after a few times, I would just put up a baby gate and then she would get her foraging toys away. He could not go anywhere near her and she could enjoy it. And she didn't have to worry anymore. So I had to do that for quite some time. Now I can each give them their own item in the same place. She still likes to go um, away from him because now it's been a habit. If it's really nice outside, if I give them something like a bone that's going to take a while, she'll stand at the patio doors. Like, can I go outside and do this? Um, and then Liam takes it to his spot. So, um, okay. My brother-in-law's dog does this a lot. And then after we'll go off to the dogs near his owner. Um, yeah, I would need to know more information about that. Um, so is it resource guarding between the dogs? Is there some stress? Um, does one dog not feel comfortable around the other dog? Like I say, um, cause it, it's also one of those behaviors that can happen due to stress. Um, so, yeah, um, so it, yeah, um, it's hard to say. So for me, you know, if I've got a couple of dogs that, you know, don't live together, but come together, um, I would want them to have some skills and, um, you know, when they are together, use baby gates and use dog beds. Um, in the meantime, I would teach them both really, really strong, um, settle mat, um, and then for each dog. And then that way, when they come together, they're in a place where they know they need to be. Um, and you can slowly build that and you can use baby gates for that. And then they can each have a foraging toy on each side of, um, the baby gate far enough away. And, um, and that sometimes takes a long time. Um, it can take like up to a year of you just doing that and creating, you know, taking away that anxiety with that. Like I say, I don't have quite enough information. Um, but if that's what it is, you know, that's what I would be working towards. Regardless, I would always, um, one of my foundation skills that, um, I teach all owners is, um, settle mat. Um, it's one of the greatest gifts that you can give your dog and yourself, um, because it helps with, in a lot of situations. Um, and the stronger you, um, create, um, it's almost like you create a magnet for your dog wants to be on there. Um, they know where they're going to be and they feel safe there. And you can use it for multi-dog households. You can use it in very in in a lot of situations. Um, Henrik, I perceive that when me and my dogs are invited to friends, they become very resource guarding, and it could be. Um, so you know, people say, well, they resource guard me, or he's your territorial. Um, you know, it. Um, do they know these dogs really well? Um, so when they're going into another person's home, um, there's always going to be a little bit of stress when you think about it. So if you go visiting, there's always a level of, um, anxiety when you go see somebody else, um, into their home and that, um, 
you know, again, it just raises a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of stress and like, oh my God, this is my dad. And what are you doing over here? So, um, I don't think it's abnormal behavior. And that's why, like I say, it's really nice to, um, if we've taught our dogs some subtle stations, you know, you can take a easy mat. Like it doesn't have to be a real dog bed. You can buy really cool mats that you just roll up and take with you and put it down. And you have a place for your dog to go lie down and hang out. And hopefully the person that you're visiting has done that with their dog so that they each have their own space and they don't have to worry. Um, and then eventually what happens is then your dogs, um, your dogs learn that they don't need to worry because, okay, they're over there and I'm over here. I have my spot. Um, so yeah. And, um, yeah. Hang on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Chantel, that's great. If you've already started working on the subtle mats, that's perfect. Keep working on it. And, you know, I don't know how much you're working on it. And just keep in mind that, you know, if they're not strong, super strong right now, you know, you want to try and get a few sessions in a day. And they don't have to be long sessions. I mean, you get big bang for your buck in just doing a minute or two. Um, I do find subtle stations easy to teach if you tend to sit in the living room in the evening and, you know, you're just chillaxing. You can just put it beside you and you can start working on it. And you can, you know, use your dog calories for uh, that sort of thing. So you don't need to use junk food or treats. So you can spend, um, you know, their supper just drip feeding it. Um, and you want to make it very intermittent. Um, you don't want them pr to predict. Um, you can slow down the drip feeding um, so that they just, you know, all good stuff happens on there as well as delivering all their foraging toy, all their um, chews. Like when I pick up a bully stick or a foraging toy, my dogs run to their stations because that's where they get delivered. Um, you know, even I have mats of stations um, in the kitchen. So that's where they get their lick mats. That's where they get, they do get a little bit of um, food with their supplements out of a bowl. Um, and they know that's where it happens. So if we build that consistency, those little routines and habits, um, they always want to go there. And then if they learn that, you know, this is where I am and that's where they are. Um, and yeah, and sometimes we need to use a baby gate if one dog's being a bit of a, you know, a little bit pushy and, is, you know, wanting to go there. And when you're practicing um, you know, when you're practicing the subtle stations with two dogs that don't live in the same household, um, it, it is more difficult. So there's a distraction. Um, so sometimes we need to use some help, um, in the, you know, like management tools, leashes, uh, baby gates and that sort of thing. There's nothing wrong with that. That helps you train. Um, and it helps you, um, you know, not have the dogs practice because it is still behavior um and it's behavior that's being rehearsed um yeah so like what anita says like spot on you know resource guard it it is often it it it's it's stress um it's absolutely and um yeah inability to disengage they just don't know how and even if we have multi dogs we have to um, um, just kind of coordinate um, you know sometimes even my dogs if we come home and um, you know different dogs are, are di like I've had multi dog households before and they're all different they all have you know like Emma used to live with other dogs. They've passed away. You know, her behavior was very different with them than they are with Liam now. Um, so, and that's, so now there's a little bit more of fear of missing out just because of the personality. So when I come home, I make sure that, you know, they're not competing and um, I try and keep things calm. Um, and like I say, you know, they have their subtle stations, they know where to go and they don't have to worry. Um, I don't leave any kind of items that, um, perhaps they have been foraging. I don't leave them on the ground. I pick them up when they're done. I pick them up and they get put away. 
The only things that stay on the ground, which they don't resource guard, are their, they have all, all these hedgehogs and Kong stuffies that they love playing together with. And um, they don't do that. Oh, thank you, Henrik. I'm glad that you found everything I said very interesting. Um, coming from you, thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I can, yeah, Henrik. Yeah, and like it, like I said at the beginning, it, you know, it depends on your dogs, um, what they've experienced, right? So um, having, you know, if they were taken away from you, um, that's traumatic and that will build that resource guarding as well. So you, you can never underestimate um, things that have happened to our dogs. Like I had a client once, um, it wasn't resource guarding, but she was really really timid well the lady was walking home and she got hit by a car um at a particular stop sign and she started describing behaviors that her dog did once they get to a certain spot and i said well where did you get hit by a car um and she says well i got hit there <laughs> so the dog was really really you know got very very stressed and just wanted to run home because you know, we, you can't deny that they're not experiencing the trauma just like we are. Um, they see it, they smell it. They, you know, they're, they're living, breathing, breathing animals, mammals like we, we just, we have the nasty big forebrain, um, to help us along. So, um, oh, wow. I made it half hour. So we've gone over, uh, we didn't, haven't really gone over that much. So I don't know if there's any other questions. I hope that you have found this helpful. Um, yeah, PTSD for sure. Um, sometimes dogs get PTS and then if it's not dealt with, it can turn into PTSD. So post-traumatic stress. Um, so first, and I mean, I'm not I can't make a diagnosis, but, um, first it can become, um, for some dogs and even for people that it's post-traumatic stress. And if it's not dealt with fast enough and depending on the what, where, and why, um, you know, then it becomes a disorder and that's, you know, more of a long-term thing. And for sure it's real in dogs. Um, Dr. Frank McMullen has, um, done a lot of work on that. Uh, he works, um, I think he's still at Best Friends Humane Society in Utah. So he's got a couple of papers. I think he has a book too. Um, so that's his um, thing he's done some stuff on. So yeah, so I'm glad that this was helpful. And I'm really grateful that you spent a half hour with me. I'm always happy when somebody shows up that reinforces me to do this. Um, sorry, I wasn't here last week, but, um, uh, I think I'm going to do this bi-weekly and, um, that way there's time for, uh, if anybody has anything to think about, I am going to be doing a puppy masterclass on Sunday. If anybody knows it was kind of, I don't do them often. Um, but I had someone I know who has some puppies going home and, um, another breeder, I reached out, so I figured I might as well do a ma puppy masterclass. It's free and um, it's being held on Sunday. So if you know anybody who's got a um, young puppy, it's meant for, you know, puppies that are just really wee ones that have just gone into into their homes. Thank you, Anita. Um, so, yeah, I will see you again for our Tuesday evening chat. And in the meantime, reach out. I'll get back to my posting. Um, I wasn't able to do that. I'm sorry, but um, I was down and out on my butt. So um, yeah, I will post it on your group. That's great, Henrik. Um, yeah, and everybody stay safe. Halloween is over now. And I know for those of you that are in the UK, you're what is a guy who, um, <laughs> uh, I'm in Canada, so we don't have that, but I lived in British Columbia when I first moved there and it was November 6th and 7th. I'm going, why are they shooting fireworks? And cause there's a lot of 
people from the UK there and they say, oh, it's Guy blah, blah, blah. I'm like, who? Who? Guy Fox Day. There we go. And it was like, oh, who? And why do I care? And why? <laughs> anyway, so, but back in Ontario, um, actually, I did hear some fireworks a little bit yesterday. So there must have been an expat around somewhere. Um, yeah. Anyways, so hopefully you've survived and, um, if there's always time to help your dog through fireworks, um, because we know, I don't know, I don't know if we have a lot of fire, we're, I think we're going to have some fireworks around Christmas and New Year's around here, but I think they're more at the park. So, um, Anita is going to have something I think really cool about fireworks happening on her page. So anyways. Have a good night and thank you very much for attending and um, this is on the group here and recorded. If you think somebody will want to listen to my chatter, you can send them over here and they can listen and always um, you can post questions. Okay, so take care.